Section 19 of The Life of Charlemagne by Thomas Hodgkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 12, Part 2, Old Age. The last of Charles' literary courtiers who can be noticed here is Einhardt, or, as his name is commonly but less correctly written, Engenhard. This man, who was born near the time of Charles' accession to the kingdom, and who survived him about thirty years, was the son of Einhardt and Engelfrita, persons of good birth and station, who dwelt in Franconia near the Odenwald. He was educated in the monastery of Fulda, and came as a young man to the Frankish court, where his nimbleness of mind, his learning, and his skill in the administration of affairs so recommended him to Charles that for the remaining twenty years or more of his reign, the little Franconian, he was a man of conspicuously short stature, was the great king's inseparable companion. His skill in all manner of metalwork earned for him in that name-giving circle of friends the name of Bezaliel, by which he is pleasantly alluded to in one of Alcuin's letters. He was employed to superintend some of Charles's great architectural works, notably the palace and basilica of Aachen, the palace at Ingelheim, and the great bridge over the Rhine at Mainz. A twelfth-century chronicler connected his name unpleasantly with that of one of the daughters of Charles, but for this scandal there does not seem to be the slightest foundation. None of Charles's daughters was named Emma, the name attributed to the alleged mistress, afterwards wife of Einhardt. His real wife appears to have been Emma, sister of Bernhardt, Bishop of Worms. About the year 826, he and his wife parted by mutual consent and gave themselves to religion. He was ordained priest and retired to the monastery of Seligenstadt on the Main, where he died about the year 840. Einhardt had a share, how large is a subject of constant discussion, in the composition of the official annals, which are our most trustworthy authority for the history of his master's reign. But we are far more indebted to him for his short track, De Vita Carolini Magna, from which several extracts have already been made. In this life there is an evident ambition on the part of the writer, who calls himself a barbarian, little skilled in Roman speech, to follow the example of the great classical authors. His imitation, especially of the life of Augustus by Suetonius, is almost servile and provokes much laughter on the part of modern scholars, but however he may be derided, the fact remains that almost all our real, vivifying knowledge of Charles the Great is derived from Einhardt, and that the Vita Caroli is one of the most precious literary bequests of the early Middle Ages. Here are some features of the picture of his master by Einhardt which have not been copied in the preceding pages. The king whose prudence and magnanimity surpassed that of all contemporary princes, never shunned on account of toil, nor declined on account of danger, any enterprise which had to be begun or carried through to its end, but having learned to bear every burden as it came, according to its true weight, he would neither yield under adversity nor in prosperity trust the flattering smiles of fortune." He loved foreigners and took the greatest pains to entertain them, so that their number often seemed a real burden, not only to the palace but even to the realm. But he, on account of his greatness of soul, refused to worry himself over this burden, thinking that even great inconveniences were amply compensated by the praise of his liberality and the reward of his renown. His gait was firm, all the habit of his body manly, his voice clear, but scarce corresponding to his stature, his health good, 
except that during the last four years of his life he was often attacked by fever, and at the last he limped with one foot. Moreover, he guided himself much more by his own fancy than by the counsel of his physicians, whom he almost hated because they tried to persuade him to give up roast meats to which he was accustomed and to take to boiled. He kept up diligently his exercises of riding and hunting, wherein he followed the usage of his nation, for scarcely any other race equals the Franks therein. He delighted, too, in the steam of nature-heated baths, being a frequent and skillful swimmer, so that hardly any one excelled him in this exercise. This was his reason for building his palace at Aquis Granum, where he spent the latter years of his life up to his death. And not only did he invite his sons to the bath, but also his friends and the nobles, sometimes even a crowd of henchmen and bodyguards, so that at times as many as a hundred men or more would be bathing there together. He was temperate in food and drink, especially the latter, since he held drunkenness in any man, but most of all in himself and his friends, in the highest abhorrence. He was not so well able to abstain from food, and used often to complain that the fasts of the church were hurtful to his body. He very seldom gave banquets, and those only on the chief festivals, but then he invited a very large number of guests. His daily supper was served with four courses only, except the roast, which the huntsmen used to bring in on spits, and which he partook of more willingly than of any other food. During supper he listened either to music or to the reading of some book, generally histories and accounts of the things done by the ancients. He delighted also in the writings of St. Augustine, especially that one which is entitled De Civitate Dei. He was so chary of drinking wine or liquor of any kind that he seldom drank more than three times at supper. In summer, after his midday meal, he would take some fruit and would drink once, and then laying aside his raiment and his shoes, just as he was wont to do at night, he would rest for two or three hours. At night his sleep used to be interrupted, not only by wakening, but by rising from his bed four or five times in one night. When he was having his shoes or his clothes put on, he used not only to admit his friends, but even if the count of the palace informed him of some lawsuit which could not be settled without his order, he would direct the litigants to be at once introduced into his presence, and would hear the cause in pronounced sentence exactly as if he were sitting on the judgment seat. And not only so, but he would also at the same time tell each official or servant of the palace what duty he had to perform that day. He was full even to overflowing in his eloquence and could express all his ideas with very great clearness, in not being satisfied with his native language alone, he also gave much attention to the learning of foreign tongues, among which was Latin, which he learned so perfectly that he was accustomed to pray indifferently in that language or in his own. Greek, however, he learned to understand better than to pronounce. He was in truth so eloquent that he seemed like a professional rhetorician, in learning grammar, he attended the lectures of Peter of Pisa, an old man and a deacon. In other studies, he had for his teacher another deacon, Albinus, surnamed Alcuin, from Britain, a man of Saxon race and extremely learned in all subjects, with whom he gave a great deal of time and toil to the study of rhetoric and dialectic, and preeminently to that of astronomy. He learned the art of computation, and with wise exactness most carefully investigated the courses of the stars. He tried also to write, and for this purpose used to carry about with him tablets and manuscripts to copy, which were placed under the pillows of his bed, in order that he might at odd times accustom his fingers to the shaping of the letters, but the attempt was made too late in life and was not successful. 
he was a devout and zealous upholder of the Christian religion, with which he had been imbued from infancy. He regularly attended the church, which he had built at Aquis Granum, morning and evening, and also in the hours of the night, and at the time of sacrifice, as far as his health permitted. And he took great pains that all the rites celebrated therein should be performed with the greatest decorum, constantly admonishing the ministers of the church that they should not allow anything dirty or unbecoming to be brought thither or to remain within it. He provided so large a supply of holy vessels of gold and silver and of priestly vestments that in celebrating the sacrifices there was no necessity even for the doorkeepers, who were of the lowest grade of ecclesiastics, to minister in their private dress. He took great pains to reform the style of reading and singing, in both of which he was highly accomplished, though he did not himself read in public nor sing, save in a low voice and with the rest of the congregation. He was very earnest in the maintenance of the poor and in almsgiving, so that not only in his own country and kingdom did he thus labor, but also beyond sea. To Syria, to Egypt, to Africa, to Jerusalem, to Carthage, wherever he heard that there were Christians living in poverty, he was wont to send money as a proof of his sympathy, and for this reason especially did he seek the friendship of transmarine kings in order that some refreshment and relief might come to the Christians under their rule. But before all other sacred and venerable places, he reverenced the church of St. Peter at Rome, and in its treasure chamber, great store of wealth in gold, silver, and precious stones were piled up by him. Many gifts past counting were sent by him to the popes, and through the whole of his reign, no object was dearer to his heart than that the city of Rome, by his care and toil, should enjoy its old preeminence, and that the church of St. Peter should not only by his aid be safely guarded, but also by his resources should be adorned and enriched beyond all other churches. Yet though he esteemed that city so highly, in all the forty-seven years of his reign he went but four times thither to pay his vows and offer up his supplications. Amid such interests and such friendships, the later years of Charles's life glided away comparatively little disturbed by the clash of arms, since his two elder sons, Charles and Pippin, brave and capable men both of them, now relieved him of most of the drudgery of war. It is hinted that there were some occasions of variance between the two brothers, but it is not certain that Pippin the hunchback is not the person here alluded to, as at enmity with the younger Charles, and the difference, whatever it may have been, is said to have been removed by the mediation of St. Gore, whose cell on the banks of the Rhine was visited by the two princes. In 806, at the Villa Theodonis, Charles, in the presence of a great assembly of his nobles, made a formal division of his dominions between his three sons. Pippin was to have Italy, or, as it was called, Langobardia, with Bavaria and Germany south of the Danube, also the subject realms of the Avars and southern Sclaves. Louis was to have Aquitaine, Provence, and the greater part of Burgundy. All the rest, that is, Neustria, Austrasia, the remainder of Burgundy, and Germany north of the Danube, was to go to Charles, who was probably to have some sort of preeminence over his brothers, though nothing was expressly said as to the imperial title. The division was so ordered that each brother had access to the dominions of the other two, and both Charles and Louis were earnestly enjoined to go to the help of Pippin, then apparently the most exposed to hostile attack, if he should require their help in Italy. Elaborate arrangements were also made as to the succession in case of the death of any of the brothers. Unhappily, all these dispositions proved futile. 
the year 810 in which Godofrit of Denmark died, and also Harun's elephant, Abu el Abbas, was in other ways a sore year for Charles. On the 6th of June, his eldest daughter, Hrotrud, once the affianced bride of the eastern Caesar, died unmarried, but leaving an illegitimate son, Louis, who afterwards became abbot of Saint-Denis. Ere Charles had time to recover from this blow, came the tidings that Pippin, the young king of Italy, had died on the 8th July, possibly, but this is only a conjecture, of some malady contracted during his campaign of many months among the lagoons of Venice. So, though Pippin left a son, the lad Bernhard, who, if things went well with him, might hope to inherit his father's kingdom, already a breach was made in Charles's arrangements for the succession to his dominions. But a yet heavier blow fell upon him next year, 4th December, 811, when his eldest son Charles, that one of all his children who most resembled him in aptitude for war and government, in strength of body and manly beauty, was torn from him by death. Now of all his sons there was only left that pathetically devout and incapable figure who was known to posterity as Louis the Pious or Louis the Debonair, but whose piety and whose good nature were alike to prove disastrous when he should be called upon to guide with his nerveless hands the fiery steeds which had drawn his father's car of empire. However, there was no other heir available. In September 813, a generalis conventus was held at Aachen, at which, after taking the advice of his nobles, Charles placed the imperial crown on the head of Louis and ordered him to be called Imperator and Augustus, thereby designating him as his successor, but not, as it should seem, admitting him to a present participation in his power. With the keen insight into character which Charles undoubtedly possessed, he must have perceived the weakness of his son's disposition and fears for the future of the empire, which he had built up with so much toil and difficulty, probably saddened his last days. The great emperor had now entered on the eighth decade of his life. His health was apparently failing, and there were also signs and portents betokening the approaching end, which, with proper regard to classical precedent, were duly recorded by Einhardt. For the last three years of his life, there was an unusually large number of eclipses of the sun and moon. A big spot on the sun was observed for seven days. The colonnade between the church and the palace at Aachen, constructed with great labor, fell in sudden ruin on Ascension Day. The great bridge over the Rhine at Mainz, which had been ten years in building, and for which Einhard himself had acted as clerk of the works, was burnt at the water's edge in three hours. Then, in his last expedition against Danish Godofried, but that was as far back as 810, a fiery torch had been seen to fall from heaven in a clear sky on the sinister side, and Charles's horse, at the same moment falling heavily, had thrown his master to the ground with such violence that the clasp of his cloak was broken, his sword belt burst, and the spear which he held in his hand was hurled forwards twenty feet or more. Moreover, there were crackings of the palace ceilings. The golden apple which was on the roof of the church was struck by lightning and thrown onto the roof of the archbishop's palace hard by. In the inscription which ran round the interior of the dome and which contained the words Carolus Princeps, the letters of the second word, only a few months before Charles's death, faded and became invisible. All these signs convinced thoughtful persons that an old man of more than seventy, who had led a hard and strenuous life, 
and who was bowed by many recent sorrows, had not long to live. In the year 811, the emperor, feeling that the end was not far off, had given elaborate orders as to the disposal of his personal property, consisting of gold, silver, and precious stones. The details, though curious, need not be quoted here. It is sufficient to say that only one-twelfth of the whole was to be divided among his children and grandchildren. About two-thirds were to be divided among the ecclesiastics of twenty-one chief cities in his dominions. The remainder was for his servants and the poor. It is interesting to observe that the division of the property was to be completed after his death or voluntary renunciation of the things of this world. There was therefore a possibility that the first Emperor Charles might have anticipated the fifth in retiring from a palace into a convent. Also we note with interest a square silver table containing a plan of the city of Constantinople which was to be sent as a gift to St. Peter's at Rome, a round one containing a similar plan of Rome, which was to be sent to the Archbishop of Ravenna, and a third, far surpassing the others in weight of metal and beauty of workmanship, which consisted of three spheres linked together and which embraced a plan of the whole world with delicate and minute delineation, and which was to be sold for the benefit of the residuary legatees and the poor. At last, the time came for all these dispositions to take effect. After the great assembly in which the imperial diadem was placed on the head of Louis of Aquitaine, September 813, Charles, though in feeble health, went on one of his usual hunting expeditions in the neighborhood of Aachen. The autumn was thus passed, and at the beginning of November he returned to the palace to winter there. In January 814, he was attacked by a severe fever and took to his bed. According to his usual custom, he thought to subdue the fever by fasting. But pleurisy was added to the fever, and in his reduced state, he had no power to grapple with the disease. After partaking of the communion, he departed this life at nine in the morning of the 28th of January, 814. He was then in the seventy-second year of his age and the forty-seventh of his reign. On the day of his death, he was buried in his own church of St. Mary's amidst the lamentations of his people. On a gilded arch above his tomb was inscribed this epitaph. Under this tombstone is laid the body of Charles, the great and orthodox emperor, who gloriously enlarged the kingdom of the Franks and reigned prosperously for forty-seven years. He died a septuagenarian in the year of our Lord 814, in the seventh indiction on the fifth day before the Calends of February. Before many years had passed, the adjective Magnus was universally affixed by popular usage to the name Carolus, and 351 years after his death, he received the honor of canonization from the Roman Church. End of section 19. Section 20 of The Life of Charlemagne by Thomas Hodgkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 13, Part 1, Results No ruler for many centuries so powerfully impressed the imagination of Western Europe as the first Frankish emperor of Rome. The vast cycle of romantic epic poetry which gathered round the name of Charlemagne, the stories of his wars with the infidels, his expeditions to Constantinople and Jerusalem, his twelve peers of France, the friendship of Roland and Oliver, and the treachery of Ganelon, all this is of matchless interest in the history of the development of medieval literature, but of course adds nothing to our knowledge of the real Charles of history 
since these romances were confessedly the work of wandering minstrels and took no definite shape till at least three centuries after the death of Charlemagne. In this concluding chapter, I propose very briefly to enumerate some of the chief traces of the great emperor's forming hand on the Western Church, on literature, on laws, and on the state system of Europe. Number one. Theologically, Charles's chief performances were the condemnation of the adoptionist heresy of Felix of Urgell by the Council of Frankfurt, 794, the condemnation of the adoration of images by the same council, and the addition to the Nicene Creed of the celebrated words filioque, which asserted that the Holy Spirit proceedeth from the Father and the Son. In these two last performances, Charles acted more or less in opposition to the advice and judgment of the Pope, and the addition to the creed was one of the causes which led to the schism between the Eastern and Western churches, and which have hitherto frustrated all schemes for their reunion. In the government of the church, Charles, all through his reign, took the keenest interest in a large as most modern readers would think a disproportionate, part of his capitularies is dedicated to this subject. Speaking generally, it may be said that he strove, as his father before him had striven, to subdue the anarchy that had disgraced the churches of Gaul under the Merovingian kings. He insisted on the monks and the canonical priests living according to the rules which they professed, he discouraged the manufacture of new saints, the erection of new oratories, the worship of new archangels other than the well-known three, Gabriel, Michael, and Raphael. He earnestly exhorted the bishops to work in harmony with the counts for the maintenance of the public peace. While not slow to condemn the faults of the episcopacy, he supported their authority against mutinous priests and preeminently by the example which he set to Gaul in the powerful and well-compacted hierarchy which he established in Germany, he strengthened the aristocratic constitution of the Church under the rule of its bishops. At the same time, there can be no doubt that by his close relations with the Roman pontiff and by the temporal sovereignty which he bestowed upon him, he contributed, consciously or unconsciously, to the ultimate transformation of the Western Church into an absolute monarchy under the headship of the Pope. That Charles, with all his zeal for the welfare of the Church, was not blind to the faults of the churchmen of his day is shown by the remarkable series of questions, possibly drawn up from his dictation by Einhardt, which are contained in a capitulary of 811, written three years before his death. We wish to ask the ecclesiastics themselves and those who have not only to learn but to teach out of the Holy Scriptures, who are they to whom the Apostle says, Be ye imitators of me? Or who is that about whom the name Apostle says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the business of this world? In other words, how the apostle is to be imitated, or how he, the ecclesiastic, wars for God. Further, we must beg of them that they will truly show us what is this renouncing of the world which is spoken of by them, or how we can distinguish those who renounce the world from those who still follow it, whether it consists in anything more than this, that they do not bear arms and are not publicly married. We must also inquire if that man has relinquished the world who is daily laboring to increase his possessions in every manner and by every artifice, by sweet persuasions about the blessedness of heaven and by terrible threats about the punishments of hell. Who uses the name of God or of some saint to despoil simpler and less learned folk? whether rich or poor of their property, to deprive the lawful heirs of their inheritance, and thus to drive many 
through sheer destitution to a life of robbery and crime which they would otherwise never have embraced? Several more questions of an equally searching character are contained in this remarkable capitulary. Number two, if doubts may arise in some minds, how far Charles's ecclesiastical policy was of permanent benefit to the human race, no such doubts can be felt as to his patronage of literature and science. Herein he takes a foremost place among the benefactors of humanity, as a man who himself imperfectly educated knew how to value education in others. As one who amid the manifold harassing cares of government and of war could find leisure for that friendly intercourse with learned men which far more than his generous material gifts cheered them on in their arduous and difficult work, and as the ruler to whom, more perhaps than any other single individual, we owe the fact that the precious literary inheritance of Greece and Rome has not been altogether lost to the human race. Every student of history of the texts of classical authors knows how many of our best manuscripts date from the ninth century, the result unquestionably of the impulse given by Charles and his learned courtiers to classical studies. It is noticeable also that this reign constitutes an important era in paleography, the clear and beautiful minuscule of the Irish scribes being generally substituted for the sprawling and uncouth characters which had gone by the name of Langobardic. Footnote. The minuscule was a small letter that displaced the awkward unseals used by the monastic scribes of the early centuries. It was the basis of the small letters of the modern Greek and Roman alphabets. End footnote. In one of his capitularies, Charles calls the attention of his clergy to the necessity for careful editing of the prayer books. Otherwise, those who desire to pray rightly will pray amiss. He enjoins them not to suffer boys to corrupt the sacred text either in writing or reading. If they require a new gospel, missal, or psalter, let it be copied with the utmost care by men of full age. In another capitulary, he expresses his displeasure that some priests who were poor when they were ordained have grown rich out of the church's treasures, acquiring for themselves lands and slaves, but not purchasing books or sacred vessels for the church's use. Something has already been said as to the academy in Charles's palace, which was apparently founded on the basis of a court school established in his father's lifetime, but became a much more important institution in his own. Probably it was then transformed from a school for children into an academy for learned men, in the sense in which the word has been used at Athens, Florence, and Paris. Alcuin, after his departure from court, founded a school at Tours which acquired great fame, and we hear of schools also at Utrecht, Fulda, Würzburg, and elsewhere. Doubtless most of these schools were primarily theological seminaries, but as we have seen in the case of Alcuin, a good deal of classical literature and mathematical science was, at any rate, in some schools, taught alongside of the correct rendering of the church service. The monk of St. Gall, who wrote, as we have seen two generations after Charlemagne, and whose stories we therefore accept with some reserve, gives us an interesting and amusing picture of one of the schools under Charles's patronage. After giving a legendary and inaccurate account of the arrival of two Irish scholars in Gaul, named Alcuin and Clement, he goes on to say that Charles persuaded Clement to settle in Gaul, and sent him a number of boys, sons of nobles, of middle-class men, and of peasants, to be taught by him while they were lodged and boarded at the king's charges. 
After a long time he returned to Gaul and ordered these lads to be brought into his presence and to bring before him letters and poems of their own composition. The boys sprung from the middle and lower classes, offered compositions which were beyond all expectation sweetened with the seasoning of wisdom. But the productions of the young nobility were tepid and absolutely idiotic. Hereupon the king, as it were anticipating the last judgment, set the industrious lads on his right hand and the idlers on his left. He addressed the former with words of encouragement. I thank you, my sons, for the zeal with which you have attended to my commands. Only go on as you have begun, and I will give you splendid bishoprics and abbacies, and you shall be ever honorable in my eyes. But to those on his left hand, he turned with angry eyes and frowning brow and addressed them in a voice of thunder. You young nobles, you dainty and beautiful youths, who have presumed upon your birth and your possessions to despise mine orders and have taken no care for my renown, you have neglected the study of literature while you have given yourselves over to luxury and idleness or to games and foolish athletics. Then raising his august head and unconquered right hand toward heaven, he swore a solemn oath. By the king of heaven, I care nothing for your noble birth and your handsome faces. Let others prize them as they may. Know this for certain, that unless ye give earnest heed to your studies and recover the ground lost by your negligence, ye shall never receive any favor at the hand of King Charles. There was one branch of learning in which Charles was evidently not enough helped by his friends of the classical revival, and in which one cannot help wishing that his judgment had prevailed over theirs. Einhardt tells us that he reduced to writing and committed to memory those most ancient songs of the barbarians in which the actions of the kings of old and their wars were chanted. Would that these precious relics of the dim Teutonic foreworld had been thought worthy of preservation by Alcuin and his disciples. He also began to compose a grammar of his native speech. He gave names to the winds blowing from the twelve different quarters, whereas previously men had named but four, and he gave Teutonic instead of Latin names to the twelve months of the year. They were for January, Wintermanoth, February, Hornung, March, Letztenmanoth, April, Ostermanoth, May, Winnemanoth, June, Brachmonoth, July, Hivimanoth, August, Aranmanoth, September, Vitumanoth, October, Windumenmanoth, November, Herbistmanoth, December, Heilagmanoth. Number three, it is, of course, impossible to deal with more than one or two of the most important products of Charles's legislative and administrative activity. Number one, in the first place, we have to remark that Charles was not in any sense like Justinian or Napoleon, a codifier of laws. On the contrary, the title chosen by him after his capture of Pavia, Rex Langobardorum, indicates the general character of his policy, which was to leave the Lombards under Lombard law, the Romans under Roman law, even the Saxons, if they would only accept Christianity, to some extent under Saxon institutions. To turn all the various nationalities over which he ruled into Ripuarian Franks was by no means the object of the conqueror. On the contrary, so long as they loyally obeyed the great central government, they might keep their own laws, customs, and language unaltered. As this principle applied not only to tribes and races of men, but also to individuals, we find ourselves in presence of that most peculiar phenomenon of the early Middle Ages, which is known as the system of personal law. In our modern society, if the citizen of one country goes to reside in the territory of another civilized and well-ordered country, he is bound to conform 
to the laws of that country. Where this rule does not prevail, as in the case of the rights secured by the capitulations to Europeans dwelling in Turkey or Morocco, it is a distinct sign that we are in the presence of a barbarous law to which the more civilized nations will not submit. But quite different from this was the conception of law in the ninth century under Charles the Great and his successors. Then every man, according to his nationality or even his profession, according as he was Frank or Lombard, Alemann or Bavarian, Goth or Roman, layman or ecclesiastic, carried, so to speak, his own legal atmosphere about with him, and might always claim to be judged, secundum legem patriae sue, footnote, after the law of his own country, and footnote. Thus, according to an oft-quoted passage, so great was the diversity of laws that you could often meet with it not only in countries or cities, but even in single houses, for it would often happen that five men would be sitting or walking together, not one of whom would have the same law with any other. But though Charles made no attempt and apparently had no desire to reduce all the laws of his subjects to one common denominator, he had schemes for improving and even to some extent harmonizing the several national codes which he found in existence but these schemes were only imperfectly realized. As Einhardt says, after his assumption of the imperial title, as he perceived that many things were lacking in the laws of his people, for the Franks have two systems of law in many places very diverse from one another, he thought to add those things which were wanting, or to reconcile discrepancies, and to correct what was bad and ill-expressed. But of all this, naught was accomplished by him, save that he added a few chapters, and those imperfect ones, to the laws of the Salians, Ripuarians, and Bavarians. All the legal customs, however, that were not already written, of the various nations under his dominion, he caused to be taken down and committed to writing. While Charles's new legislation was in general of an enlightened and civilized character, a modern reader is surprised and pained by the prominence which he gives or allows to those barbarous and superstitious modes of determining doubtful causes, wager of battle, ordeal by the cross, and ordeal by the hot plowshares. As to the first of these, especially the language of the capitularies seems to show a retrogression from the wise distrust of that manner of arriving at truth expressed half a century earlier by the Lombard king Liutprand. Number two, a question which we cannot help asking, though it hardly admits of an answer, is what was Charles's relation to that feudal system which so soon after his death prevailed throughout his empire, and which so quickly destroyed its unity. The growth of that system was so gradual, and it was due to such various causes, that no one man can be regarded as its author, hardly even to any great extent as its modifier. It was not known to early Merovingian times. Its origin appears to be nearly contemporaneous with that of the power of the Arnulfing mayors of the palace. It must certainly have been spreading more widely and striking deeper roots all through the reign of Charlemagne, and yet we can hardly attribute, either to him or to his ancestors, any distinct share in its establishment. It was, so to speak, in the air. Even as democracy, trades, unions, socialism, and similar ideas, are in the air of the 19th century. Feudalism apparently had to be, and it sprang and grew up, one knoweth not how. End of section 20section 21 of the life of Charlemagne by Thomas Hodgkin this LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 13, Part 2, Results One of the clearest allusions to the growing feudalism of society is contained in a capitulary of Charles issued the year before his death, in which it is ordained that no man shall be allowed to renounce his dependence on a feudal superior after he has received any benefit from him, except in one of four cases, if the Lord have sought to slay his vassal, or have struck him with a stick, or have endeavored to dishonor his wife or daughter, or to take away his inheritance. In an expanded version of the same decree, a fifth cause of renunciation is admitted. If the Lord have failed to give the vassal that protection which is promised when the vassal put his hands in the Lord's and commended himself to his guardianship. Other allusions to the same system are to be found in the numerous capitularies in which Charles urges the repeated complaint that the vassals of the crown are either endeavoring to turn their beneficia into allodia, or of possessing property of both kinds, a beneficium under the crown and an allodium by purchase or inheritance from their fathers, are starving and despoiling the royal beneficium for the benefit of their own allodium. Number three. An institution which was intended to check these and similar irregularities and generally to uphold the imperial authority and the rights of the humbler classes against the encroachments of the territorial aristocracy was the peculiarly Carolingian institution of Missi Dominici, or, as we may translate the words, imperial commissioners. These men may be likened to the emperor's staff officers, bearing his orders to distant regions, and everywhere, as his representatives, carrying on his ceaseless campaign against oppression and anarchy. The pivot of provincial government was still, as it had been in Merovingian times, the Frankish comes or count, who had his headquarters generally in one of the old Roman cities and governed from thence a district which was of varying extent, but which may be fairly taken as equivalent to an English county. Under him were the Centenari, who originally, rulers of that little tract of country known as the Hundred, now had a somewhat wider scope, and acted probably as vicarii, or representatives of the Count, throughout the district, subject to his jurisdiction. These governors, especially the Count, were doubtless generally men of wealth and great local influence. They had not yet succeeded in making their offices hereditary and transmitting the countship as the title of nobility is now transmitted from father to son. The strong hand of the central government prevented this change from taking place in Charles's day, but it too, like so much else that had a feudal tendency, was in the air, and it may have been partly in order to guard against this tendency and to keep his counts merely life governors, that Charles devised his institution of Misi. But a nobler and more beneficial object aimed at was to ensure that justice should be truly and indifferently administered to both rich and poor, to the strong and to the defenseless. It is interesting in this connection to observe what was the so-called Eightfold Ban, proclaimed by the Frankish legislator. Anyone who, number one, dishonored Holy Church, number two, or acted unjustly against widows, number three, or against orphans, number four, or against poor men who were unable to defend themselves, number five, or carried off a free-born woman against the will of her parents, or number six, set on fire another man's house or stable, seven, or who committed harris shoot that is to say, who broke open by violence another man's house, door, or enclosure, number eight, or who, when summoned, did not go forth against the enemy, came under the king's ban, and was liable to pay for each offense sixty solidi, thirty-six pounds. Here we see 
that three of the specified offences were precisely those which a powerful local count or centenarius would be tempted to commit against the humbler suitors in his court, and which it would be the business of a misus dominicus to discover and report to his lord. The misi had, however, a wide range of duties beyond the mere control and correction of unjust judges. It was theirs to enforce the rights of the royal treasury, to administer the oath of allegiance to the inhabitants of a district, to inquire into any cases of wrongful appropriation of church property, to hunt down robbers, to report upon the morals of bishops, to see that monks lived according to the rule of their order. Sometimes they had to command armies. The brave Gerald of Bavaria was such a misus, and to hold placita in the name of the king. Of course, the choice of a person to act as a misus would largely depend on the nature of the duties that he had to perform, a soldier for the command of armies, or an ecclesiastic for the inspection of monasteries. As Charles, in his embassies to foreign courts, was fond of combining the two vocations, and sending a stout layman and a subtle ecclesiastic together to represent him at Cordova or Constantinople, so he may often have duplicated these internal embassies, these roving commissions, to inquire into the abuses of authority in his own domains. We have, in one of Charles's later capitularies, an admirable exhortation, which, though put forth in the name of the Misi, surely came from the emperor's own robust intellect. Take care, the Misi say to the count whose district they are about to visit, that neither you nor any of your officers are so evil disposed as to say, hush, hush, say nothing about that matter till those Misi have passed by, and afterwards we will settle it quietly among ourselves. Do not so deny or even postpone the administration of justice, but rather give diligence that justice may be done in the case before we arrive. The institution of Misi Dominici served its purpose for a time, but proved to be only a temporary expedient. There was an increasing difficulty in finding suitable men for this delicate charge, which required in those who had to execute it both strength and sympathy, an independent position, and willingness to listen to the cry of the humble. Even already in the time of Charles there was a visible danger that the Misus would become another oppressor, as burdensome to the common people as any of the counts whom he was appointed to superintend. And after all, the Misus could only transmit to the distant regions of the empire as much power as he received from its center. Under the feeble Louis the Pious, his wrangling sons and his inept grandsons, the institution grew ever weaker and weaker. Admirable instructions for the guidance of the Misi were drawn up at headquarters, but there was no power to enforce them. With the collapse of the Carolingian dynasty toward the close of the ninth century, the Misi Dominici disappear from view. Number four. Another institution was perhaps due to Charles's own personal initiative. At any rate, it was introduced at the outset of his reign and soon spread widely through his dominions. It was that of the Scabini, whose functions recall to us sometimes those of our justices of the peace, sometimes those of our grand jurors, and sometimes those of our ordinary jurors. Chosen for life out of the free but not probably out of the powerful classes, men of respectable character and unstained by crime, they had, besides other functions, preeminently that of acting as assessors to the comes or to the centenarius in his court of justice. Seven was the regular number that should be present at a trial, though sometimes fewer were allowed to decide. As in all the earlier stages of the development of the jury system, they were at least as much witnesses as judges, their own knowledge or common report forming the chief ground of their decision. 
It is not clear whether their verdict was necessarily unanimous, but it seems certain that the decision was considered to be theirs, and not that of the presiding functionary, whether Comes, Vicarius, or Centenarius. It was, moreover, final, for as one of the capitularies distinctly says, after the Scabini have condemned a man as a robber, it is not lawful for either the Comes or the Vicarius to grant him life. The Scabini were expected to be present at the meetings of the county, probably also, to some extent, at those of the nation, and they joined in the assent which was there given to any new capitularies that were promulgated by the emperor. It is easy to see how both in their judicial and in their legislative capacity the Scabini may have acted as a useful check on the lawless encroachments of the counts. There was probably in this institution a germ which, had the emperors remained mighty, would have limited the power of the aristocracy and have formed in time a democratic basis upon which a strong and stable monarchy might have been erected. Number four. Lastly, a few words must be said as to the permanent results of Charles's life and work on the state system of Europe. In endeavoring to appraise them, let us keep our minds open to the consideration not only of that which actually was, but also of that which might have been, had the descendants of Charles been as able men as himself and his progenitors. The three great political events of Charles's reign were his conquest of Italy, his consolidation of the Frankish kingdom, and his assumption of the imperial title. Number one. His conduct toward the vanquished Lombards was on the whole generous and statesmanlike. By assuming the title of King of the Lombards, he showed that it was not his object to destroy the nationality of the countrymen of Alboin, nor to fuse them into one people with the Franks. Had his son Pippin lived, and transmitted his scepter to his descendants, there might possibly have been founded a kingdom of Italy, strong, patriotic, and enduring. In that event, some of the glorious fruits of art and literature, which were ripened in the independent Italian republics of the Middle Ages, might never have been brought forth, but the Italians, though a less artistic people, would have been spared much bloodshed and many despairs but we can only say that this was a possible contingency. By the policy inherited from his father, which he pursued toward the papal see, Charles called into existence a power which would probably always have been fatal to the unity and freedom of Italy. That wedge of church dominions thrust in between the north and south would always tend to keep Lombardy and Tuscany apart from Spoleto and Benevento, and the endless wrangle between Pope and King would perhaps have been renewed even as in the days of the Lombards. The descendants of the Pacific and God-crowned King would then have become unutterable and the not-to-be-mentioned Franks, and peace and unity would have been as far from the faded land as they have been in very deed for a thousand years. Number two. Charles's greatest work, as has been once or twice hinted in the course of the preceding narrative, was his extension and consolidation of the Frankish kingdom. One cannot see that he did much for what we now call France, but his work east of the Rhine was splendidly successful. Converting the Saxons a triumph of civilization, however barbarous were the methods employed, subduing the rebellious Bavarians, keeping the Danes and the Sclavonic tribes on his eastern border in check, and utterly crushing the Avars, he gave to the Teutonic race that position of supremacy in Central Europe, which, whatever may have been the ebb and flow of Teutonism in later centuries, it has never been forced to surrender and which, with all its faults, has been a blessing to Europe. Number three. 
as to the assumption of the imperial title, it is much more difficult to speak with confidence. We have seen reason to think that Charles himself was only half persuaded of its expediency. It was a noble idea, this revival of the old worldwide empire and its conversion into a Civitas Dei, the realized dream of St. Augustine, but none knew better than the monarch himself how far his empire came short of those grand prophetic visions, and profounder scholars than Alcuin could have told him how little it had really in common with the state which was ruled by Augustus or by Trajan. That empire had sprung out of a democratic republic and retained for centuries something of that resistless energy which the consciousness of self-government gives to a brave and patient people. Charles's empire was cradled not in the city but in the forest. Its essential principle was the loyalty of henchmen to their chief. It was already permeated by the spirit of feudalism, and between feudalism and any true reproduction of the Imperium Romanum there could be no abiding union. I need not here allude to the divergence in language, customs, and modes of thought between the various nationalities which composed the emperor's dominions, the mutual antagonism of nations and languages was not so strong in the Middle Ages as it has been in our own day, and possibly a succession of able rulers might have kept the two peoples, who in their utterly different languages swore in 842 the great oath of Strasbourg, still one, but the spirit of feudalism was more fatal to the unity of the empire than these differences of race and language. The medieval emperor was perpetually finding himself overtopped by one or other of his nominal vassals, and history has few more pitiable spectacles than some that were presented by the rulers of the Holy Roman Empire, men bearing the great names of Caesar and Augustus, tossed helplessly to and fro on the waves of European politics, the laughing stock of their own barons and marquises, and often unable to provide for the ordinary expenses of their households. But all this belongs to the story of the Middle Ages, not to the life of the founder of the empire, it would be absurd to say that he could have foreseen all the weak points of the great and on the whole beneficent institution which he bestowed on Western Europe. And whatever estimate we may form of the good or the evil which resulted from the great event of the 800th Christmas Day, none will deny that the whole history of Europe for at least 700 years was profoundly modified by the life and mighty deeds of Charles the Great. End of section 21. End of the Life of Charlemagne by Thomas Hodgkin. Recording by Pamela Nagami in May of 2016.